Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. On episode 241, I chat with Joe Kane about the newly formed UHD Alliance and the future of television. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded January 29th, 2015, episode 241. Joe Kane on Ultra HD. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is Joe Kane, video guru, industry consultant, and popular guest on Home Theater Geeks. Hey, Joe, welcome back to the show. It's wonderful to be here. Always great to have you with us because there's always a ton of interesting stuff that comes out of our discussions, and uh, I know today will be no different. Now, for those of you who are logged in to the chat room at irc.twit.tv, which you can reach by watching live at, at uh, live.twit.tv, uh, you can post questions for Joe as we go along, and I will pass along as many as I can. Now, <clears throat> Joe, I wanted to get you back on the show right now after CES, because at the show last almost a month ago now, hard to believe, uh, we saw the introduction of uh, an organization called the UHD Alliance. And we also saw uh, or learned about the specifications for the Ultra HD Blu-ray specification, which is coming up later this year. And I was so heartened to, to hear the industry starting to talk about I implementing certain things within the content for UHD, Ultra HD, sometimes called 4K, uh, including high dynamic range, wide color gamut, that sort of thing, uh, in the content and also in the displays so that finally we can be start to talk about getting more than simply more pixels. Um, I've heard you say, and I've quoted you saying that UHD today, UHD TVs today are nothing more than HD TVs with four times as many pixels, but they're the same color, the same dynamic range, everything's the same as current HD TV. And you've been advocating for a long time, we need to go beyond that. And now finally, we might have some inkling that the industry is starting to think about going beyond that. Uh, what was your take on these announcements at the show? I was certainly pleased to see it happening because now there is an endorsement uh, by a large large part of the community, including post-production, uh, manufacturing, and uh, distribution, to making a commitment to bringing more to UHD than we've had in the past. Equally important is that they're pressing forward probably faster than standards might catch up. In other words, they're going to make it happen sooner rather than later. And once we've had enough experience with a functional system, then we'll probably standardize it. <laughs> Is that how it usually works? That, that the... Uh, that the technology develops first and then it then we codify it? That certainly was the case as an example of the digital cinema initiatives. Uh, mm -hmm. The system was put together, was actually fully functional before uh, it was officially standardized. So we were actually working from 
a functional system, which in a way was uh, rather important in uh, creating standards. But this is an opportunity to move forward fast enough to hopefully maintain the interest of consumers uh, the standardization process could take a lot longer and could push off UHD to a point where it may not become important if we don't start moving now. Mm. Well, it seems like we're starting to move now. I mean, the UHD alliance, uh, uh, as I said at the opening, was announced uh, and it has a number of manufacturers, TV manufacturers. I think Samsung's leading the charge. Uh, but there's also, I think, Panasonic and LG, as I recall. Uh, there are also a couple of studios, at least, who have signed on. Uh, a couple of, as you say, post-production houses. Um, <laughs> but but it, I, as I learned after the show, it, it's so new, there hasn't even been a meeting yet, has there? Well, of course, that's changed since CES. Um, their um, inaugural meeting was last week uh, here uh -huh. in Hollywood. Uh -huh. So... Uh, yes, there is now, uh, uh, there has now been an official meeting of the Alliance. And as I understand it, they spent a lot of time trying to work out the uh, administrative details of how the organization was going to be functioning. Mm. Well, I suppose they need to do that first before they can actually get down to the nuts and bolts of of what are we going to do here with a uh, with high dynamic range, wide color gamut, bit depth, all that stuff that you and I have been talking about for a very long time. Um, still, it, it seems to me you might be somewhat heartened by these developments. Well, I, I certainly believe that it's going in the right direction. And in reality, a lot of things that were shown at CES as starting points uh, either for the Alliance or at least suggestions to the Alliance, the starting points actually were quite far ahead of what I had hoped would happen. Uh, th there's a complete difference between the reality of what I think should be happening and how fast people actually do it. And I wasn't confident that we would be... Uh, where we are today as soon as we are uh, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, you saw, I'm sure, the the Samsung demo where they had side-by-side -side of, of some content from, uh, I think it was um, Exodus and Life of Pi that had been regraded, uh, remastered, if you will, uh, for Samsung's new generation of TVs called SUHD where the dynamic range was increased. They were grading for a peak brightness on the TV of 1,000 nits, whereas currently it's at 100 nits. Um, no, and with 300 a nits. Oh, it, or do they grade at 300 nits now? I hadn't well, realized. All right, sorry, I'm sorry, 100 nits, you're right. Uh, I'm I'm confusing 30-foot Lamberts and multiplying. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Too many um, dimensions. Yeah. Too many dimensions to think about. Uh, my understanding was that currently, current content on Blu-ray and broadcast and everything is graded in such a way that, that the, the studio assumes that the peak white output, the peak light output from a TV is 100 nits or roughly 30 foot Lamberts. Um, and what we saw at, at CES was a comparison of that on one type of display, normal, quote-unquote, conventional display, next to Samsung's new SUHD TV, which has a peak light output of 1,000 nits, and the content was graded for that and shown on that TV. And that really is the key to me, uh, is having the studios go, uh, well, we've, we've got these TVs with this capability, let's make the content conform to that capability and you'll see something really special. And we did, didn't we? Uh, we certainly did. Uh, equally important, the Samsung demonstration was done at a higher bit depth than the uh, conventional display. And that higher bit depth was quite obvious in the amount of detail that was in the dynamic range that was in the picture. Yes, yes. 
Um, I, I unfortunately I didn't send a, a, this graphic, but I had a comparison graphic of the of this display, and you couldn't really you know take a photo of that. You can't really see it, but uh, I did notice that, for example, there was a shot of in Life of Pi of a sunset or a sunrise, and the sun in the in the high dynamic range image, you could actually see the disk of the sun in that very bright part of the image. Whereas on the standard display, you couldn't. It was just this white blobby so area. It was all blown out in the exactly. eight, in the 8-bit version. And in the 10-bit version, there was a great deal of detail around the sun. It yes. wasn't blocked out. And right. it, it, it was an obvious improvement uh, in the picture. Yep, yep. And that's what I've been saying all along. And I think you have said it too, that you, you'd be very happy, I think, if we brought 10 bits, higher dynamic range, wider color to HD TV, to 1080p. That would make a far bigger difference, a far better picture than we have now than simply adding more pixels. Well, and I've, I have actually been advocating that UHD should be a minimum of 8 bits. There, or, I'm sorry, minimum 10 bits. There should be no 8 bits allowed mm. in UHD TV. Uh, that would be another thing that would make it vastly superior to what we have now today. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to, to give you a dem to give you a demonstration of how important bit depth is, we're talking about bit depth, the number of bits used to represent the dynamic range. Um, I have a um, I have a graphic called bit depth, which we can take a look at. Here it is. Uh, <clears throat> this is this is a gross exaggeration. I mean, if you had only uh, two bits, you you could have four levels of brightness, and that's shown on the left here. And you, you only see four bands of gray, and it's very, it's obvious. I mean, you couldn't really watch a picture that had only two bits of, of dynamic range. Four bits gives you 16 levels of brightness, and that's still not enough for a, any kind of TV picture. Uh, we currently have eight bits, but as you can see on the right, the more bits you have, the smoother the transition, the more levels you have to the point where it becomes, it doesn't look like a stair step anymore. It looks like a continuous ramp, what's called a ramp. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the more bits you have, the more, the smoother the, the image looks. And that's important not only in brightness dynamic range, but also in color gamut, the range of colors that, uh, that can be represented, right? Well, certainly, uh, bit depth is required to get a smooth transition between black and white. But if you look at color space, a small color space um, requires a few bits. But if you get a large color space, you need more bits to get there. So as much as you want to increase the dynamic range of luminance from a small number to a big number, you need more bits for that. The same is true for color. If you want to go further out in the color capability, uh, you need to do it uh, with more bits. If you don't have more bits, you're going to have the same kind of banding that was illustrated in the four bits, uh, four bit example or two bit example that you just showed. You'll have what is known as contouring or banding in the picture. So the bit depth is really necessary for both color and black and white. Mm -hmm. And color gamut or color space is another thing we're thinking about here. And, and looking toward expanding. <clears throat> and we have another graphic I was gonna, gonna show here called gamuts. Um, and so here we have a representation. We've seen this before on the show, but it certainly bears repeating. Uh, we've got this representation of all the visible colors, which are in this guitar pick shaped thing, where you can see where the greens are and the blues and the reds and the whites right in the middle. Um, and then we have these three triangles. Uh, the smallest one, is the one we use currently. It's called Rec. 709. Um, the middle one, the somewhat larger one in the middle there, is the one used in digital cinema. It's called P3. And the largest one is the one that everyone's talking about for UHD TV. It's called Rec. 2020. Um, but there are a number of reasons why that one's impractical. And so I think, Joe, what do you think? I don't think we're going to see many displays that can 
actually achieve REC 2020 uh, anytime soon, right? Well, it, it's not only a case of not seeing displays that can do REC 2020. I'm taking the position that we're going to discover that 2020 is so far out on the edge that it's not going to have the bandwidth necessary in red, green, and blue to give you the kind of fidelity where everyone will agree that the picture is, is the same or to their liking. So mm. I actually think there are some problems with 2020. Um, it's not only the color, but it's also the bandwidth of the color. And among the things that we've discovered is when each color has a bandwidth, there is much more agreement among human beings about uh, the color of the picture. When there is a very narrow bandwidth for red, green, and blue, there is room for human beings to disagree about what they're seeing as a color. So right. I actually think going out to 2020 might be a mistake uh, in terms of universal recognition of picture quality. Mm -hmm, Gr mm -hmm. Granted, and by there will... There will be more colors, but uh, there will be a lot more disagreement on what we think we're seeing. Mm -hmm. By bandwidth, I just want to make sure everybody understands, is the, the range of colors uh, for each primary. So, for example, when you look at uh, Rec. 709, which is the current uh, color gamut that we use today, the green is actually composed of a number of different frequencies or wavelengths of light such that it's it kind of forms a a, a bell-shaped curve a bell-shaped bell -shaped curve. curve exactly That's right yes and, and e3 20, is the same yes well it's a, it's a little bit more narrow but uh yes it still has a bandwidth but the 2020 colors look like a stick uh, they look like, you know, just a stick instead of a bell-shaped curve around the stick. Right, right. And as a result, well, for one thing, you, you probably can't achieve that with anything other than lasers. Uh, this is also known as single wavelength primaries. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or there's a question in my mind about whether or not quantum dots can, can approach that or not. Uh, it, they, it seems to me they probably can. I don't know. What do you think? Certainly, in theory, they should be able to reach uh, something close to uh, single wavelengths. At the moment, they're not there. At the mm. moment, they're actually struggling to get to P3. Mm. And, and so, being that as it may, it seems to me that we should really be aiming or targeting P3 as the color gamut to, to work toward and, and to standardize on, A, because it's already being used in commercial cinema, so the studios already know it well mm -hmm. and master their content to it. B, it is possible to achieve, uh, unlike 2020, which is pretty impossible at the moment. It'll get possible later. But C, also, as you said, with 2020 or these single wavelength um, primaries, there is no longer a, a widespread agreement about you put a color up on the screen and everybody says, oh, yeah, that's whatever color it is, yellow or blue or whatever, uh, because of this, this weird thing in humans uh, that uh, is called, <laughs> it's got a weird name too, metamerism, uh, which is when you look at a color if it's composed of these single wavelength primaries, you and I will very likely, or possibly anyway, see something different from each other. And I think what you're always aiming for is high color fidelity and consistency that everybody sees the same thing. Yes, and I, and I actually believe that um, the color spectrum of P3 would give us a far better color fidelity and it would... Um, it would still provide us with something that has a potential of agreement among a large viewing audience. Now, that said, there, I'd also like to tell you that there are at least some proposals 
instead of going to P3 or in addition to going to P3, that we include Adobe RGB, which is a common color space in electronic imaging to print imaging. Mm. Uh, so it is also a really common color space. Uh, it, the green, the red and blue are the same in Adobe RGB. The green is pushed over more towards the center of the diagram. And so for whatever, I, I think just because um, Adobe RGB has a following in the print industry, there's also suggestions that P3 might also be an option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, Adobe RGB might be mm. an option in addition to P3. Too many right. letters. <laughs> it's definitely alphabet soup. <laughs> no question about it. Uh, I have, I do have an illustration of, of one reason why we do want a wider color gamut than, than 709. Um, and I believe it's called, let me just quickly look here, uh, gamut examples. There it is. Let's take a look at that. So here we see uh, the uh, a picture of a flower, of some flowers, yellow flowers, and a picture of some blue butterflies, which are technically called morphos, by the way. Uh, have, having been a butterfly collector in my youth, I, I'm familiar with that. Anyway, we, we see here the CIE diagram, this thumbnail or guitar pick shaped graphic, uh, with the colors uh, in their, those respective pictures uh, in, charted within the diagram. And notice how in the case of the flowers, the yellow is outside the triangle of Rec 709, but inside the triangle of what in this case is Rec 2020. Similarly, the blue, the shiny blue of the morpho butterfly wings is outside of Rec 709, but inside 2020, which means that if you had a TV with, uh, that displayed 2020 uh, and the content was coming in with that color, it would be displayed accurately or relatively accurately. And the, the same can be said of P3. P3 is still outside of 709 by quite a bit. And so these colors would be more at more accurately represented uh, in, in P3 than they would in 709. Now, in, in a discussion of color, the majority of colors that are displayed are within the 709 color space. Mm. And you've you've just shown examples where they are outside, and and there are lots of examples of going outside of that space. But still, the majority of what we display in color is mm. in the seven hundred nine space. Now, if if I can take that part of the conversation a little bit further, when we capture information, whether we capture it on film or capture it electronically we are actually capturing a much larger space. Otherwise, you would never know that those colors are going outside of the 709 space. Mm. And so the reality is when, when we shoot material for motion picture content or television content, we are most likely shooting a larger gamut than we can reproduce. Mm. And if that gamut exists on set, as an example, if we were in the streets of Las Vegas and all the neon signs, then you would find lots of colors that are going outside of 709 space. And in those cases, the information, the, uh, the real colors would be captured, but then they would have to be squeezed down into a much smaller space in the process of making a 709 master. Now, taking that one step further, when you talk to colorists, people who are responsible for creating the look of whatever you're seeing, they are telling me that it's actually much more difficult to compress a large color space when it is shot, a la Las Vegas, you know, the strip in Las Vegas or Times Square or whatever. It's mm -hmm. actually more difficult to color correct for 709 space than it is to color correct for P3 because P3 allows more of what's captured. Therefore, there is less concern on their part of what they have to reduce. Mm. Uh, well, if, that makes, if you could, makes total sense, yeah. So, so the, the, the interesting part of this from a production standpoint 
is if we have a larger color space, be it P3 or Adobe RGB, it will actually be more efficient and easier to color correct content that is shot than the experience we're having today. Mm. Uh, so the, stu the studios then are probably uh, in favor of increasing the color gamut that they're going to deliver to consumers in the home, would seem to at, me. At the moment, there is at least talk of the fact that it's easier to color correct for the P3 digital cinema than it is the 709 Blu-ray master that uh, goes out. And so there is minimally a recognition of it being easier to color correct for a larger color space than a smaller color space. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, that's one aspect. You mentioned capturing images and content like on the strip or in Times Square or wherever. Um, I know that you've got some things to say about that, about the capturing uh, part of the process that uh, people need people need to, to keep in mind. Uh, for example, capturing at a resolution even higher than 4K is important, isn't it? Okay, that, that is absolutely another part of it. Um, in order to be prepared for anything that's coming, uh, you pretty much have to shoot at a much higher rate than anything you anticipate delivering. Now, today, it's not only pixel count, but it's um, dynamic range, both in color and in luminance. Now, fortunately, the cameras that are coming out today uh, can usually capture 14 bits worth of information. It's all pulled out of the camera as a 16-bit word, but most of the content, both in color and in luminance, can be captured at a much higher rate than we are able to display. Now, that's absolutely critical if we're going to make the UHD system look as good as it can look. And I use this as an example, DVD got a lot better when we started mastering at HD. When we went to HD, especially for HD DVD and ultimately Blu-ray, we realized that we had to master at 4K in order to get really good 1080p. Mm. And, and so now that we're talking about putting out an image that is approximately 4K, we really need to talk about shooting it at an even higher resolution and higher bit depth than anything we plan on distributing. Fortunately, that's what is happening in at least the bit depth part of it is happening in a lot of capture. Uh, so we, so we, do we, so we have cameras that are being used today that are capturing at at uh, twelve or even ideally sixteen bits. Uh, certainly fourteen bits. Fourteen. And okay. Yeah, certainly 14 bits. As I said, it comes out of the back end of the camera is a 16-bit word. But when you look at what the lens and the sensor is capturing, it's probably about 14 bits. Okay. Uh, so 14 bits in, in reality that's coming out is a 16-bit word. Right, but it's probably padded with a couple of zeros. That, that's correct. In, in other words... 14-bit uh, isn't a common format. 16-bits is a much more common format. So everything's right. just being pulled out as 16-bits. Mm -hmm. What about what about resolution? What 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 are current cameras capable of capturing just in terms of spatial resolution? Well, there's there is luminance spatial resolution and there is color spatial resolution. Ah. The we're currently, for the majority of cameras that are out there, we're using single sensors. And those single sensors have to have red, green, and blue elements in them. And the majority of sensors have at least twice as many green uh, pickup areas as they do red and blue. Hmm. So oh, Why uh, is that? Well, it, it, it's a matter of how many pixels can you fit on a uh, chip of a particular size. Sure, uh, but why why not distribute them evenly? Why not have the same number of red, green, and blue? Well, 
this goes back to our analog perception of picture quality, where it is said that color resolution isn't as important as luminance resolution. And this, of course, was the justification for our 422 system, where the resolution of the luminance information was always higher than the resolution of the color. So in building these sensors, in being practical about how difficult it is to read information from each sensor and, and get it off the chip, the number of pixels has been reduced to a more practical application, uh, a more practical number. And so there are, I'm not aware of anybody that's making sensors where there is an equal number of elements for red, green, and blue. Mm. And I, so- I wonder if it's because, I wonder if there are more green, sen green sensing elements than red or blue because green is the, color to which our eyes are most sensitive. Uh, that's certainly where it's coming from. The green gotcha. represents the majority of luminance information. Ah, and right, so, of course. So where, where you create a black and white signal and then two color different signals, uh, the green is the majority of that black and white signal. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, because it is it is the most luminant, <laughs> if, if that's a word. Uh, of the three primaries. It has the most luminance. It's the brightest. Well, certainly as we perceive light, it's uh, it contains the majority of information that we perceive um, as detail, mm -hmm. as, as luminance detail. So the green channel has um, often twice as many elements in it as the red and blue. And so... The red and blue are shared across, a single red and blue would be shared across two um, black and white or green elements, uh, elements that get used uh, to form black and white. Mm -hmm. And so um, cameras now don't have an absolute resolution. And it's not only can uh, cameras, incidentally, is the... Uh, line arrays that are used in film scanning. Again, the line array has red, green, and blue elements in it, and there are not as many uh, red and blue elements as there are green elements ah, along so when that line array. Right. So when you're scanning in a, a, a actual physical film into digital form, you're you're scanning in one line of pixels at a time. And again, here we have the same situation, more green than red and blue. Yes. And it's usually by a factor of two. There's usually at least twice as many green elements as there are red and blue. <laughs> so, so does that well, mean that talking about resolution like 4K or 8K or whatever uh, isn't quite as simple as uh, one might think? No. Uh, as an example, in my opinion, if you want a legitimate red, green, and blue signal where each of the channels has a 4K resolution, then you pretty much have to start off with what is known as an 8K sensor because there's only 4K elements in the red and blue in that 8K sensor. So if you want a legitimate red, green, and blue that has a full... 4K of resolution, you usually start out with an 8K sensor. And and are there such cameras? Do they exist? Can, do we have 8K cameras that we can use? Uh, uh, I'm 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 laughing. Uh, <laughs> we have 8K line arrays that can be used to scan uh, 65 millimeter film, mm -hmm. and there there have certainly been 8K cameras shown. And the uh, Sony F65 has an array that can deliver a legitimate 4K in red, green, and blue. But there aren't many options that can actually deliver a legitimate 4K. Mm. 
And this is part of the reason when I talk about taking advantage of the format and delivering everything the format can produce, I'm always talking about having to shoot it at a much higher resolution than we're delivering to ensure that we're actually filling up the bit space with real information. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is uh, this is all very interesting and there's a lot more to talk about, but I hope you'll excuse me for just a moment while I take this moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is a new sponsor for this show called Blue Apron. Now, cooking and eating should be fun. I certainly think so. Uh, but if you're busy or you're health conscious or you just don't know your way around a kitchen, cooking can be a real chore. And believe me, I know this. Ordering out, of course, is fine, but it's expensive and it gets unhealthy really fast. And who knows how long that food in the grocery store has been sitting on the shelves or how far it has had to travel. Hey, you can forget all of that. What you need is Blue Apron to make cooking fresh, delicious meals easy. Here's how it works. Uh, for $9.99 per person, per meal, Blue Apron will send you a refrigerated box with just the right high quality ingredients in the exactly right proportions and simple step-by-step -step recipe instructions right to your door. And these ingredients come from local farms. So you'll be getting produce that's currently in season at a, the peak of freshness. Hey, meals are only 500 to 700 calories per serving, though you'd never guess it given how delicious they are. They work around your schedule and your dietary preferences. Cooking takes about half an hour, Shipping is always free, and the menu always features new recipes. They'll never send you the same meal twice. Hey, you can make meals like chicken drums, buffalo style, blue cheese celery salad, or vegetable ramen. That sounds mighty good to me. You'll cook incredible meals and be blown away by the quality and freshness. Blue Apron is fast, fresh, and super affordable. You're going to love this service. I can guarantee it. And you're going to cook like a gourmet chef. To see what's on the menu this week and get your free, your first two meals free, all you have to do is go to blueapron.com slash twit. Hey, that's right. Two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron very much for their support of home theater geeks. So, um, Getting back to this conversation about what we can expect in the UHD universe, which is coming at us faster than slower, I'd say. Uh, we've talked about high dynamic range. We've talked about color gamut. We've talked about capturing content in higher than 8K, which is really necessary. Oh, I, there was one point I wanted to make uh, to, to finish off that little bit there, Joe, which is, you know, we've got the uh, Sony F65, which is a very expensive professional digital cinema camera. Um, uh, we've got cameras from Red Techno Red Digital Cinema, which claim to go to 5 and 6K, but again, there's this color sensor issue that might reduce that, that effective resolution. Um, but you happen to know of a way to do it where almost anybody can do it already. Shooting at nearly 8K using digital single lens reflex cameras. Can you believe uh, that? It's amazing to me. And well, it's it's certainly been a lot of fun. Uh, there are certainly options from Nikon, Cameron, yeah, Canon and Hasselblad. And so, well, Hasselblad probably isn't mm, single lens reflex. I'm not quite sure if, it's, if it qualifies as that. It's, it's right. a much bigger camera, but I've actually been able to go out and shoot material at resolutions higher than most motion picture camera people have seen. In fact, the demonstrations of my material that have been done at the SEMTI conferences and at the Hollywood Post Alliance conferences, most people in the industry looking at my images are shocked by how much resolution can actually be put in to a 2160p signal. They're looking at that and saying, boy, boy, that's that's more resolution than I ever thought this system could do. And of course, that's part of the reason I'm advocating 
uh, shooting at a higher resolution because I can easily illustrate where it will deliver a far better picture. Yep. And I've seen many of those photos as well. And, and you've done some video, I think, too, at, at those high, high uh, resolutions, right? Well, when you say video, it's... Um, it's oh, stop motion. It's it's um, uh, in other words, I'm shooting about uh, one picture per second. And and so I'm looking mm. at stepped motion. But mm. yes, I am absolutely shooting what I call stepped motion sequences. And of course, when you edit them together, you can see all sorts of wonderful things happening, like clouds moving in the sky and uh transportation vehicles moving and Whizzing people by, walking. Yes, yes. yes. And so um, it's, it's not the fluid motion that you're used to with cameras that are specifically for motion. But when you look at the images that I have, they show a level of resolution that is hard to come by from current motion cameras. Well, but that but that still begs the question, you know, we want to uh, ultimately what we're talking about here is movies, TV shows and so on with uh, with fluid motion in them at hopefully higher than 24 frames per second. That's another issue that we haven't talked about yet. High frame rate. Um, but that's, I guess, at this point, impractical. Uh, I know that uh, NHK in Japan has shown 8K movie cameras essentially um but i i guess they're not practical or widely available yet are they no um it is my understanding those cameras are prototypes and that um you know there's only maybe one or two of them out there there aren't there aren't very many and you certainly yeah. can't go to your local rental store and uh, <laughs> find one now right. that said i i think a small part of the reason imaging is shall we say, behind the displays is because there was no real expectation in the industry that the displays were going to happen anywhere near as fast as they did. Uh, certainly, Sony, as an example, opened Colorworks here in Hollywood to uh, be mastering uh, for the 4K format. But they had no idea <clears throat> that it was actually going to come along anywhere near as fast as it did. So while they were starting to be prepared for it, uh, suddenly the demand for it was much larger than they anticipated in the time frame that, that they are currently working. Now, that said, the sensors are there. Uh, there is a firm belief, as an example, the sensor that's in my Nikon D810 could be read out at 60 pictures per second if you had the horsepower in the processing. Now, mm. at $5,000 for the camera, there is not the horsepower to read out from that sensor at that rate. In fact, the sensor in bursts, it, it will, I don't remember what the frame rate is, but even even that camera in bursts will do something like 20 or 30 pictures per second at that resolution, at that mm. capability. But the buffer very quickly fills up and the camera says, not anymore, I'm not doing this. Uh, mm. I, I'm exhausted. My buffer is full. <laughs> uh, and until I empty my buffer, you're not getting any more pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not going to shoot a two-hour movie with a, with that camera for sure. <laughs> <laughs> not unless you want to shoot it a couple of seconds at a time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we, yes, exactly. Okay. So, as you say, and I think it's a really important point to uh, make sure we understand the image capture industry, if you will, is lagging behind the display industry. And they kind of got caught with the uh, caught off guard uh, by I, the fact that 4K TVs started coming out so quickly. I, I certainly uh, believe that. That, uh, and, I, and proof of that is in Hollywood itself. The, the Hollywood community wasn't prepared for this to happen. And so um, you, didn't have, you didn't have material all ready to go when all these displays came out. 
Yeah, which was which was really unfortunate um, and caused all the consternation that we're facing now. And only now this year are we starting to see evidence that we're moving in the direction where we can take advantage of these TVs um, in, a, in a better way. Now, of, among the things that we wanted to talk about here, we talked about uh, dynamic range to some degree, but I wanted to make sure we talked about the fact that <laughs> there is as yet no standard way to do high dynamic range. Uh, there are, I know of five different uh, systems that are currently on out in the, in the market to some degree that uh, <clears throat> can represent high dynamic range. Uh, what's going to happen there? Are we in for another format war or things going to, how's that going to shake out? Do you think? Well, in, in, when it comes to high dynamic range, the studios are, I believe, out in front of innovation in making some things happen. Certainly, uh, Dolby with Dolby Vision has had the highest visibility in presenting high dynamic range content. And they've piqued the interest of the studios in creating that kind of content. But quickly, there were other solutions to high dynamic range. And uh, those alternate solutions, uh, at least three of them were shown at CES. And I'll talk about what those solutions are in the moment. But having seen that many potential targets that Hollywood would have to fulfill, there is already a move to create a single method for mastering high dynamic range so that the studios only have to make one master. And then there is going to be an ability to get from that single master to anyone's individual system for delivering high dynamic range. So I'm encouraged on the production side of it that there will be a single method used to create a master. Um, I sort of expect once that is actually settled that the majority of people who are offering widely different approaches to high dynamic range are potentially going to gravitate to the single system that is being proposed for creating that high dynamic range. Now, there will be variations in light output depending on what displays can do. But at least as far as production is concerned, I actually see that there is a strong desire for a single way of creating the content, which is going to greatly reduce the complexity of high dynamic range. Mm -hmm. And re reduce the cost to the studio, which is always in their best interest and what they're really focused on, right? Well, and it, I'm, I, I would dare guess that it's a driving force behind <laughs> want, wanting, wanting a single approach. In other words, right. th they're, the studios are looking at what has been shown as high dynamic range capability and then asking the question, how do we be prepared to feed all of these systems and not have to master for each one of them? Yes, so exactly. I, I am absolutely encouraged by the fact that they are trying to come up with a single method of creating HDR content. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, those of us at the consumer end of things may still, we'll see TVs, uh, uh, Samsung with their SUHD uh, was implementing, I believe, the, the high dynamic range standard called SMPTE 2084. Uh, Hisense and TCL were showing displays using Dolby Vision. Um, and you saw a demo, which was, I, I didn't get to see it, unfortunately, of, uh, of the high dynamic range system from uh, Technicolor and Philips, I believe. Uh, it certainly, Philips wasn't named in the display, but it's, um, it's my understanding that Philips and Technicolor are sort of proposing the same thing. So for the time being, it might be fair generally to include them in the same category. Mm -hmm. but, but their proposal, and the BBC has talked about this as well, 
Mm -hmm. uh, their proposal is to stay much closer to our existing system of 8-bit delivery in, in providing a higher dynamic range. How can and, that be? How, can, how well, can that be? <laughs> um, if you don't provide much more than we currently have, as an example, um, what they're proposing to do is to take advantage of what manufacturers are currently doing in the dynamic mode of a TV set. You already know that if you go from the movie mode to the dynamic mode, that you have a great deal of uh, brightness coming out of the dynamic mode. And uh, unfortunately, they jack up the sharpness control and they change the color of gray and the whole bit. But yeah. if, you, if you were to imagine a dynamic mode where... All we're doing is increasing the light output out of the set. Now, in theory, we're already driving that set with an 8-bit signal. And so if you turn up the brightness um, or turn up the light output of the set, we're still operating from an 8-bit signal. And so far, consumers aren't complaining about this. So there is a theory that, well, we could just deliver pictures that are specifically set up for the dynamic mode or the dynamic light output mode, and mm -hmm. we could call that high dynamic range. <laughs> well, but wait a second. If you're still, if you're doing that, if you're assuming that you've got this extra light output because you've put the TV in some sort of dynamic mode, uh, but you're still sending it eight bits. You've got a greater distance between black and white. Won't that, with only eight bits, result in more banding that we were talking about earlier? Uh, it, it certainly will. It it will result in banding, contouring, and noise. Mm. That uh, certainly, I'm I'm confident you're aware that when you raise the light output, that there's more noise in the picture. Uh, yeah. Basically. Basically, you're stretching a, a limited bandwidth over a much larger area, and that's where the contouring and noise come from. Now, yep. they're making the assumption that the consumer is not going to care. Huh. And I'm saying, gee, you know, if we really want this to be something, we've got to make it something. And I agree with Dolby that it should be done at 12 bits. but a number of manufacturers are saying, but we don't have 12-bit displays, so why do we deliver 12 bits? And I, I can, in, in my own mind, I can justify delivering 12 bits even if the display can only do 10 bits. But something that was important to come out of uh, CES was that we saw the Samsung demonstration doing 10 bits. And as you pointed out earlier in the program, when you saw the sky with the sun in the middle of it, uh, you could actually see the uh, differentiation of light going into the sun, where on the 8-bit display, it just looked like a blown out circle. Yep. So the 10 bits offered something more in picture quality than could be had from the um, eight bit signal. Now, if we go back to the Technicolor demonstration, they basically demonstrated a higher light output and they showed it at eight bits. And you know, it, it was, they showed a normal eight bits and they showed a recorrected eight bits. Now in their case, they actually moved the luminance curve based on the brighter output of the display. So they're making a claim that the that their 8-bit HDR is different from the standard 100-nit picture. And they're also saying, and this is part of what uh, was written in the BBC paper, that this HDR signal this 8-bit HDR signal is more compatible with existing displays. Uh, but 
the problem with being more compatible is it's offering less in picture quality or picture differentiation yes. than can be offered. And I'm voting for the larger picture differentiation and then dealing with the fact that, yes, we have to do a little bit more to get some compatibility between the two signals. Right. And certainly I know Dolby and I believe Simpty also, Dolby Vision and Simpty 2084, uh, do this by encoding the extra dynamic range in metadata, in an enhancement layer that if it, if it comes into a TV that doesn't recognize that, it just gets ignored and you have a regular picture, right? I, I think that's a, it's, it's an important point to make that um, Dolby's system has a base layer. And I instead of calling it a meta metadata for the moment, I just like to call it a layer. Okay. Uh, sure. Because it's it's continuous. The the information is continuous. Where the implication of metadata is metadata could be interrupted. It doesn't need to be there all the time. Mm. In other words, metadata only has to be there when there's a change that occurs in the picture. Where what Dolly is proposing is actually a layered system where there is an 8-bit 709 layer, and then there's an augmentation layer that takes the primary layer up to 12 bits, up to a larger color space, and up to a larger dynamic range. Mm. So as you pointed out, if somebody is looking at the Dolby Vision signal without this high dynamic range set, they are going to see their normal 8-bit 709 picture. And if they have a set that will decode the extra layer and add it back into the primary layer, then they're going to see a dramatic difference. Now, at this point, I'd like to go on and add that Dolby is proposing that the light output of the display is going to be somewhere from 2,000 to 4,000 nits, which is, of course, going to be able to take advantage of the 12 bits as opposed to the 10 bits that uh, was shown in the Samsung display. So uh, they're proposing a higher uh, bit depth, and they're also proposing a much larger light output. I mean, and, I don't think there are any, <clears throat> any conventional displays today that can do... 2,000 or 4,000 nits, right? Well, uh, at NAB uh, last year, uh, Philips showed a display that would do 2,000 nits. Mm. So <clears throat> it it's there and it can be done. The question is, can it be done and still get an energy star rating? <laughs> yeah, there's that mm. too. Can it be done and still qualified to be sold in California for mm -hmm. the amount of power it would consume? And incidentally, mm -hmm. the California standards, as far as manufacturers are concerned, have been pretty much accepted by the manufacturers as being national. In other words, mm -hmm. there's no building a California set. Uh, right. There used to be, there used to be California cars, but there aren't California TV sets. <laughs> and so, so the higher standards that California set have pretty much been national and international because, gee, it's even difficult to differentiate a set that is sold someplace else in the world from a set that's sold in the United States. Right. So their power consumption issues for high dynamic range are in a way being set by California uh, energy consumption standards. Hmm. Um, hmm. Now, the peak, uh, uh, the quantum dot technology or the, uh, I've forgotten what else it's called, but anyway, the, uh, the quantum dot technology is certainly more efficient in light output so that for a given amount of power, we can come up with more light out. And now, that's, this is, of course- This is an interesting point. I, pardon, pardon me for interrupting. Uh, yep. SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room it made a comment a little while ago. He said he spoke with a tech at Technicolor who said that some displays like OLED, and I, I was going to bring up OLED as well as Quantum Dot, may not be able to reach the <clears throat> thousand nits 
uh, for HDR specs, much less 2,000 or 4,000 that Dolby wants. Uh, that's certainly what I'm seeing. Now, when we talk about OLED, uh, it's fair to talk about contrast ratio as opposed to an LCD set where we really want to talk about light output. Mm. The fact that the OLED sets can go lower in black means that they can come up with a substantial contrast ratio at a lower light output. And that for the time being is certainly what manufacturers of OLED displays are depending upon. They're depending on the fact that you'll see contrast ratio and not light output. Mm. And it, it, it won't be light output because they can't get there. But they're, right. they're, they're depending on you seeing a contrast ratio. And, and being so, able to go deep, deep, deep into the blacks. Right. And so they're depending on that as being the sales gimmick. If you, I'm, I'm sorry the for pitch. calling it that. Pitch, the sales thank you. Pitch, shall we, shall we call much, it? Yeah. Much, much, much better. <laughs> uh, so, and OLED actually has an advantage when it comes to high dynamic range. As much as they don't have the light output, they have a large ratio difference between a, a complete flat field of white and a small area of white. So mm. that a small area of white can be 10 times as bright as a flat field. So if you accept a great or a large picture contrast ratio as being one thing, and if you except the fact that some high dynamic range is going to be small areas of the picture. What it means is the OLED display will look fantastic because suddenly you will have as much as 10 times the average light output in small areas of the picture, which will give you the perception of a really high contrast, even if the absolute light output isn't all that high. Hmm. Um, that brings up the issue of gamma, uh, which is how the how much light comes out of the TV based upon the brightness encoded into the signal. Uh, and and this is a whole nother topic, which unfortunately we don't have very much time to talk about. And I know it's a big one, um, but the fact that OLED can go really low into the blacks you still need to be able to see the, and distinguish detail between small differences in brightness at the low end of the spectrum, right? That's the whole thing about gamma. At, at, at the low end of the grayscale. Grayscale, yes. Yeah. I, Sorry, I, yes, you're right. Uh, no, 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 no. I want to make that distinction because I'm going to report on something that I've seen in a number of OLED displays. I want to be careful and say that it is not necessarily representative of all OLED displays, but in the larger displays, when you put up a gray ramp that only covers the bottom end of the grayscale, what you see is there's no resolution in that grayscale and or the resolution that appears on screen is far below eight bits. Mm. So, so there. I, I'm bringing this up because you're talking about what does the picture look like at the bottom end of the grayscale, and right. how does it come out of black? Right. It it turns out that forcing an OLED display to conform to the 2.4 gamma curve uh, is actually making it extremely difficult to get bit depth down at the bottom end of the scale. If gamma were shifted closer to one, again, we're at 2.4 now, if it were shifted much closer to one, it would be much easier for actually all sets, OLED and LCD, it would actually be much easier for them to come out of black and not have the banding in the dark part of the picture. So I realize I dragged this conversation a little bit off in another direction. Oh, that's fine. Ga Gamma is actually critical because 
The 2.4 gamma that we have uh, always used based on the two uh, based on the CRT is not efficient for any of our current technology. All of our current technology would rather see a gamma much closer to one, and you would you would get less banding and less noise in the picture if the source gamma were much closer to one than the 2.4 number. But uh, but doesn't that also mean that the content then needs to be mastered differently with with a gamma closer to one? Isn't it still mastered with that 2.4 gamma or the inverse of that? Uh, expecting that the TV is going to implement a gamma in the 2.4 range? It's certainly mastered. The, it, it, it's interesting that you use uh, the phrase inverse of 2.4 um, because there is actually no such thing as a fixed gamma when you're creating content. You change the gamma of the content to get the look you want on a... Uh, display that has a gamma of 2.4 uh, that that's just a technical point but i i um, All right. uh, but there is no there is actually no fixed gamma in creating content ah but, okay uh you what you do is you tune the source to look good on a gamma of 2.4 mm. so in this new television system that i've been talking about I want to abandon a great deal of what we've done in the past for the new system. At the same time, recognizing that any display that is out there has to have compatibility with existing systems. But for the new system, I'd like just, just to abandon a great deal of what we've been doing now and take a fresh look at the fact that system standards came from display technology. Well, the display technology has changed completely. Therefore, the standards for creating content should change completely for future content. And well. so... I'm advocating a gamma of uh, much closer to 1.0, which is actually easier to process than to have to have this gamma curve involved anyway. Mm. And it's it's much easier to take a linear approach to bit depth. And that effectively means that the bits are being used linearly uh, across the entire dynamic range instead of being used in a log function where more bits are used at one area of the picture, one brightness of the picture, than they are used at another brightness of the picture. Mm. So we would be far more efficient if we could go to a gamma of one and it'll be interesting to see if anybody has the guts to go that far <laughs> in creating this new UHD system. Well, I, I look forward to observing it as you do. Uh, we've, we've got a very interesting year ahead of us, I think. Uh, before we go, just one really quick question from AVS member Paul Vicente. What's the status of your UHD test materials? Are they available to the public at this point? Yes. The UHD test materials that we've had out um, have been available since this past October. And ah. if if you go to my website, videoessentials.com, and uh, go into products, uh, you'll see a UHD system. They are a UHD uh, product. They're out on a USB stick because the majority of UHD TV sets have USB inputs. Therefore, that was the most convenient way we had of getting test signals into your TV set is plug it in the back of the TV set using the USB connector. Mm -hmm. Not now, to mention the fact that, that UHD Blu-ray isn't even available yet and won't be for probably most of this year. Yeah. So I actually feel good about the fact that we've been on the market since October with test patterns. So mm. we are slightly ahead of a lot of people in that respect. Now, do, the, do your test patterns have a high dynamic range, wider color gamut, the, these sorts of things we've been talking about today? Well, uh, the answer is not yet. Mm. Um, the interesting part of that is that by releasing on a USB stick, it effectively means that we can put updates um, in the website and for subscribers, they can just download new test patterns, new everything that we do. As mm. an example, um, 
a 10-bit display has been introduced to the market from Samsung. Well, somebody's got to be able to prove that that's actually a 10-bit display. <laughs> so we have to have test signals that will do 10 bits. And the H.264 and H.265 MPEG encode systems actually have 10-bit profiles. So we can actually get 10-bit test signals out on the market. And the point that I'm actually trying to make is that, as you've pointed out, things are changing. And as they change, much more needs to be made available. We elected to create a product where it could be easily updated as we need to update it. So ask me what I'm coming out with. I'm taking a look at what's being done and saying, gee, we've got to create test material to find out if they're doing it right. And therefore, there are going to be ongoing updates to this program. I think it's and a fabulous idea. I just think it's great. And it, it, it removes the limitation of you buy a Blu-ray or a disc of some sort, and that's it. You can now go and update your content as it becomes relevant and as you develop it, which I know you will. You know, we've, we've, we've run way over here, and so I must thank you so much for being here and, and uh, hope that you will come back again to enlighten us again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So uh, as Joe said, his website is videoessentials.com, and uh, I do recommend that you go check that out. Uh, you can reach me, of course, at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Now, you can also find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg, and also on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Lori Fincham of THX, who will be talking about a new amplifier technology he has been working on for the last several years and is now finally out in the market uh, and is a really cool technology. So I do hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out. Geek out.